recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But The Truth. It's January the 15th, 2015. And uh, we have Tom Fress with us again, along with Yor from Juggler 66. And we're going to have a, a discussion on, well, the title of the discussion is Counterfeit Bibles. Uh, before we start, though, uh, as usual, I'm going to start out with the headlines from Yahoo.com. Headline number one. Pope on Charlie Hebdo, there are limits to free expression. Imagine that coming from a pope. This is the Associated Press. Aboard the papal plane, Pope Francis said Thursday, there are limits to freedom of speech, especially when it insults or ridicules someone's, would you imagine that would be, faith. Uh -huh. Uh, let's just see. Uh, the next article I found here is uh, from the Christian Science Monitor. Cardinal decries feminized Catholic Church in backlash against Pope's reforms. Even though he has been shunted to the uh, ceremonial position, the formerly most powerful Catholic Archbishop in the United States remains perhaps the most, and I imagine that that may be vocal. Um, let's see. Uh, Cardinal, once again, Cardinal Burke is in, is in the news. This is uh, Newsday. Cardinal Burke is right. Women are terrifying. Alexandria uh, Petra, Newsweek. <clears throat> Gives you an idea what to think about women, huh? Uh, then we got uh, Fox Business videos. Mike Huckabee weighs in on Pope's speech comments. Former governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee, on Pope Francis suggesting limits of expression, making fun of others' faith. Let's see if we can maybe get one or two more. We got a lot of worldly things today. Uh, oh, yeah. Another article about the Pope's visit to the Buddhist temple in Sri Lanka. If that's something that's really important. More articles on Pope's visits to the Philippines. Oh, here we go. Reuters, Pope says climate change mostly man's fault. By Philip Polua aboard the papal plane. I guess they have a special plane just like the President of the United States. Huh? Uh Pope Francis says on Thursday that he believed that man was primarily responsible for climate change and that he hoped this year's Paris conference would take blah, 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 blah. And, of course, we need to ask the question, if there is really any climate change, which men are actually doing it? Because you and I aren't. All right. And with that, I think I'm going to end that uh, reading of the articles. I'm going to bring in Tom Fress now. Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Nice to be here, Michael, and good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Good evening to your listeners. Nice yeah. to be here. <laughs> and, and once again, Jorg is with us. Uh, Jorg, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm quite fine also. Thank you very much. I'm still uh, under the impression of the broadcast that we did last night because that really took a lot out of me, and I think it took even more out of Tom. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I kept my head spinning almost all night, so I haven't slept too much uh, because I was going around that all the time, and uh, I'm very thankful for that because uh, I learned a lot yesterday with that broadcast, and so I'm very much looking forward to the one um, that Tom is providing us with us today uh, because I think he's always good for a surprise. Oh, yeah. This, this should be an interesting discussion. So, Tom, the, the title of the show we decided was Counterfeit Bible... At Bibles, and uh, I guess I'll just let you lead, and we'll go, we'll follow along. So. All right, I'll do the best <laughs> I can, and and good evening to you, Yerk. It's it's nice to be in such fine company with you and Michael. So we'll get right to the subject of the discussion: uh, Bible perversions. Look, I'm going to make a common sense statement to which everyone can agree. If God utters a word. May man change that word? May man add to or take away? 
And if man chooses to change what God says, whether it's a jot or a tittle, or the entire meaning, he has done violence to the throne of heaven. He has marked himself as antichrist. Now, <clears throat> when God utters something, he admonishes all never to add to or take away from his word. Because if you change one word that, the, that God says, it's no longer God's word, it's someone else's. God never changes anything that cometh forth from his mouth. We can trust God not to change his mind because he doesn't make errors. He's not like a man that he should error. He should uh, uh, make a mistake. And so it should be obvious that God has taken whatever divine steps necessary to preserve his word and to expose those who have changed his words. Now, every one of us at some point in time in our lives have said something and someone else adds to or takes away or changes the meaning altogether of what we've said. And how does that make us feel? I'm talking about just normal human instances where we've been misquoted or we, we've been uh, misunderstood by whatever devious means. It's an assault, isn't it? It's, it's never taken with glee when someone changes or alters the meaning of, of what we say, especially when we're talking about serious matters. And God always talks about serious matters, life and death issues, eternal life and eternal death issues. And so what are the consequences, both from God's perspective and from ours, when someone alters his word, either adds to or takes away or changes the meaning in one way or another of what he says? Let me give you an example out of the Bible. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and those who listen regularly notice I focused on that specific scripture for a good long while now. This is a centerpiece example of how man has changed the meaning of God's Word. Not necessarily the text, but the meaning, Daniel 9.27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, if you come from any of the churches that I've attended in my life, you'll know that the orthodox teaching in the churches today teach that this he spoken of here is not Jesus Christ, but Antichrist. And it clearly says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Who was the subject of all of the scriptures prior to verse 27? It was Jesus, the Messiah. And yet we're taught in the churches that this is speaking of Antichrist, what Antichrist will do in the future. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he, the Antichrist, shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, do you think it makes any difference to change the identity of the he spoken of there from Christ to Antichrist? These scriptures speak of none other but Christ our Messiah, Jesus, 
who died for our sins, who confirmed the covenant with his, in his blood by performing that covenant on the cross. That's how you confirm a covenant. And he did it for many. He did it for you and me. He did it for one week, a seven-year period of time. Which, by the way, if you've heard any time in your church about a seven years of great tribulation, this is the seven-year period of time where they get that seven years of tribulation. It's not speaking of seven years of tribulation. It's talking about seven years of Christ's ministry. Well, but you say, now, wait a minute, Tom. Christ's ministry began when he was baptized, and it ended at the crucifixion three and a half years later, in the midst of the week, right? But we also know that the Spirit of Christ descended upon the, the, those gathered together in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and the Spirit of Christ continued to confirm the covenant in his blood for the remaining three and a half years. Remember that prophecy had to do with a seven-year period of time. It had to do with the Jews, and it had to do with Jerusalem, and it had to do with Jesus and the covenant that he confirmed with his own blood. We've been taught something entirely different. For 50 years of my life, I was taught by every church, every pastor that I'd ever attended my whole life, that Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 was not speaking of Jesus Christ, but was speaking of Antichrist. What violence that has done to the throne of heaven without even changing one letter without adding a jot or a tittle or taking anything away from God's word, they simply changed the identity of the he spoken of there from Jesus Christ, our Messiah, to Antichrist of the future. And what are the consequences? We've been talking about it for a long time here on Mike's program. And Yerk... Have participate, has participated in those discussions. And what it really boils down to is, is a denial that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. That Jesus didn't confirm a covenant with many for one week. That Jesus didn't fulfill that covenant with his blood. that Jesus did not cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease when God ripped the veil of the temple, when Jesus gave up the ghost. It's a denial that Christ has come, and we must wait for another. That is the subtle, diabolical purpose behind changing the identity of the word he in this passage from Jesus Christ to Antichrist. I hope hope the listeners can see the obvious motive behind that, that change. And I reckon that if I had a month of uninterrupted discussion here, I don't think I could outline all of the consequences that have resulted from the changing of the identity of the he in verse 27, from Jesus Christ to Antichrist. I simply don't think that I could cover it all in a month the consequences of changing the meaning of that scripture. I'll just briefly tell you. You know, the Bible talks about wars, wars, and rumors of wars. That is one of the consequences of changing the meaning, the identity of the he in verse 27, from Jesus Christ to Antichrist. 
because the deceiver must now conform the world and get the world to accept a future seven-year period of time in Israel. So Israel must become a nation again. There must be Jews living in the land. There must be a seven-year peace treaty allowing the Jews to build a temple and to begin animal sacrifices again. To make a future seven-year event fulfill what Jesus did 2,000 years ago by confirming this covenant with his blood. To make this prophecy fulfill itself in history, literally what God destroyed 2,000 years ago, the nation of Israel and the temple on Temple Mount must be rebuilt. And that's what we're seeing today. And how, do, how was that achieved? How was that achieved? How do you create a nation? And then how do you force Jews to move down to the land? Do you realize I've just described to you the motive behind World War I and World War II? Remember the Bible says wars, wars, and rumors of wars? And peace, peace. When there is no peace, if there's no peace, what is there? War. The Bible says, once again, there'll be no peace till the Prince of Peace comes. No matter how much the Pope or the kings of the earth preach peace, we must have peace in our time. We must unify all the religions of the world and all the governments of the world and put them under one single solitary authority to stave off all need for war in the world. One world religion and a one world government, and the whole world will sing a big kumbaya. That's what they're telling us. But what does the Bible tell us? God's word that cannot be altered, that cannot be added to or taken away from, and if you change the meaning of it, you destroy it, what does the Bible say? There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. And that Prince of Peace is Jesus, the Messiah, at his second coming. The same Jesus that fulfilled and confirmed the, his, the covenant in his blood on the cross. And whose ministry lasted not three and a half years, but seven years, just as Daniel prophesied. And it was he who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. But the whole world says, no, 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 this takes place in the future, the distant future, at least 2,000 years from the time Christ died on the cross, 2,000 years roughly before Christ's return, and then this Antichrist will confirm a covenant for one week, for one seven-year period of time. They call it the Great Tribulation. And in the midst of the week, after three and a half years, he'll cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Well, common sense tells you, to cause sacrifices and oblations to cease, they must be going on. Well, how do you do animal sacrifices and oblations to God without a temple? So a temple must be built. You first have to have a nation of Israel, which God destroyed 2,000 years ago. You must have a temple, which God destroyed 2,000 years ago. You must have Jews living in the land, which God forced into diaspora 2,000 years ago. Why did he disperse the Jews? Because they were stuck on animal sacrifices, and they rejected Jesus Christ and wanted to go back to their Temple Mount worship. Listen, you've got to know that if they didn't receive Jesus as their lamb, they wanted to continue sacrificing lambs and goats and calves, and doves, and pigeons. God wouldn't have it anymore. He had the Roman 10th Legion destroy the city and the sanctuary and disperse the people. Why? Because the gospel was going to the Gentiles. If these Jews that used to live in Jerusalem who practiced the animal 
to the Temple Mount worship, the sacrifices and oblations on Temple Mount, if they were allowed to remain in Israel, continue that system, which God replaced with his own son, if they were allowed to continue there day after day after day by their actions, by their sacrifices, continuing to reject Jesus Christ in, in favor of animal sacrifices, they would never get the gospel, would they? The only, the only place the Jews were ever going to get the gospel was among the Gentile nations where God sent the gospel. On the day of Pentecost, he sent the gospel to the Gentile world. Jerusalem was full of Gentiles, and they all heard the gospel in their own language from Jews who had never spoken the language before. And my bet is that they repeated it back to the Jews to confirm that they understood what they said, and they confirmed it back to the Jews in the Hebrew language. And both had knowledge that the gospel had gone forth. God confirmed his covenant to the Gentiles in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, still confirming the covenant in his blood. Confirmed the covenant in his blood by the same fashion until the end of the 490th year, the end of the 70th week of Daniel when they stoned Stephen. The last utterance to the gospel officially to, the, to, to, to Jerusalem was the government of Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin. And Stephen gave them the gospel, and they stoned him to shut him up. And that ended the 490-year period of time. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, the Jews and Jerusalem. And the gospel then went to the Gentiles. But we're told that Jesus didn't confirm a covenant. Verse 27 is not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Antichrist. He did not confirm a covenant. A future Antichrist will confirm a covenant. And a future Antichrist will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. What violence, what violence they've done to the throne of God, to the word of God, and to our minds, and the spiritual consequences for those who believe in this future Antichrist fulfillment of what Jesus firmly confirmed 2,000 years ago cannot be uttered in this short period of time. My voice would fail me to, to relate to you all the consequences. So futurism is a must accomplish for the Antichrist of the Bible, uh, of the world. That is the papacy. The papacy must, in order to fulfill their futurist interpretation of a prophecy that Jesus Christ himself fulfilled 2,000 years ago, must have a nation state of Israel. 1948, they accomplished it. Through the persecutions of World War I and World War II against the Jews, they not only brought forth the need for a modern nation state of Israel, but they persecuted the Jews until they desperately des desired a place of refuge. That's how you get the world's Jews to move to the modern nation state of Israel. Persecute them beyond any human comprehension. And not only that, but you have to silence the voices of the Jews who say, God dispersed us, and we're not going back to any so-called homeland until he leads us back, just like he led us out of Egypt by his own hand, by the Shekinah glory, where he fed us and watered us and heated us and shaded us through the desert and defended us against all of our enemies. We're not going back to know Israel until God leads us back. No human government can replace the voice of God. And if we're called back to Jerusalem, to back to Israel, then God will lead us there just like he did when we came out of Egyptian bondage. Those voices had to be silenced. And so Hitler killed six million of them to shut them up. You see, the Pope, who was the power behind Adolf Hitler, ordered Hitler to shut them Jews up. 
because it's the Pope, the biblical Antichrist, that needs to fulfill his future 70th year phony refulfillment of this prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. Why? Because he rejects Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He rejects the blood that he shed on the cross. He's practiced a, another sacrifice ever since its beginning. It's called the Mass. And they look for a future fulfillment of this one. Having rejected Christ just like the Jews did, they want a refulfillment of, of a phony, counterfeit, antichrist, satanic refulfillment of it in the future, where they can present to the world another Christ. I hope this is making sense. Now, the subject of this discussion after I've demonstrated the consequences for changing God's word, adding to it or taking away from it. The subject of our discussion is today the New Age Bible versions. How do we tell? I've been asked this over and over and over in my discussions on amateur radio. Tom, what Bible do you read? What what Bible should I buy? What Bible should I read? And the answer is simple. The one that's criticized the most. Well, Tom, what Bible is that? The King James Version of the Bible. Do you know there are universities literally created for the purpose of discrediting the King James Bible? The papacy has waged a continual, unrelenting, war against the King James Bible ever since it came off the press. And when they couldn't burn all the Bibles, and when they couldn't burn all of those who read the King James Bible, they had to admit that they couldn't stop God's Word because God was behind its preservation. So they took another tack and that is to flood the Bible market with counterfeit Bibles that change God's Word, that takes away, that adds to, that changes the meaning, and eliminates whole passages of the Bible altogether. Every alternative Bible out there that's available today has one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to destroy God's Word and to destroy your understanding of it so that they can fulfill their future phony refulfillment, their antichrist refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel that Jesus fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Now, I want to, I have in my hands a copy of a book, which admittedly I have not read yet, but I've seen many, many reviews of it. I've talked to other people that have read this book, and it is entitled New Age Bible Versions, New Age Bible Versions. The subtitle is An Exhaustive Documentation Exposing the Message, the Men and Manuscripts, Moving Mankind to the Antichrist One World Religion. This book is probably one of the most valuable books in my library, and I can say that with full confidence, even though I haven't yet read it. In this book, a woman by the name of Gail Ripplinger makes a side-by-side comparison Against the King James Bible, she claims the King James Bible is the authentic, preserved word of Almighty God, and she compares the text of that Bible, verse by verse, with the NIV, the NASB, the New King James Version, the NRSV, the NAB, the REB, the RSV, the CEV, the TEV, the GNB, 
the Living Bible, the Phillips Bible, the New Jerusalem Bible, and the New Century Bible. You see, Satan wants to make sure you can have your pick of any erroneous Bible that you fancy. Flood the market with counterfeit versions of God's Bible, diluting his truth, diluting your mind, and preparing you for what Rome intends to achieve in the world through this phony refulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And I can't warn you strongly enough against these Bible perversions, but don't take my word for it. Get a copy of this book and read it like your life depends upon it. Check Gail Ripplinger out in every fact that she presents. And if you, like many Americans, don't like to read and would rather sit and watch a video, then I've got a video for you, and Michael will post it in the uh, <clears throat> on the board. Simply go to YouTube and type in the search engine Gail Ripplinger, G-A-I-L, common spelling for Gail, Ripplinger, R-I-P-L-I-N-G-E-R, common spelling. Ripplinger, just like it sounds, R-I-P-L-I-N-G-E-R. And watch her two-hour and 30-minute video. Yes, that's a long time, but it's a very short time compared to the consequences that will come upon you if you read a counterfeit Bible. Gail Ripplinger, New Age Bible Versions, and watch the video on YouTube, Gail Ripplinger. And she'll show you in overhead projections, side-by-side -side comparisons between the authentic Word of God, the King James Version of the Bible, and all of these New Age counterfeit Bibles that load the Bibles at bookstores all across this nation. Do you realize that most of those Bible bookstores, if you want a King James Version, an unadulterated copy of God's Holy Word. You have to special order it. They don't carry them. They don't carry them. They want you to believe in a future counterfeit fulfillment and that Jesus was not the fulfillment of Daniel 9.27. And they'll go to any and every link to make sure that you depart from the King James Version of the Bible, the true, authentic Word of Almighty God, and believe a lie. Lies are a dime a dozen, but the truth is more precious than fine gold. And that fine gold is the King James Version of the Bible, not the New King James Version. That book has over 6,000 changes. From the, New King, uh, from the King James Version of the Bible. If you're reading a New King James Version of the Bible, you, your mind has been corrupted. You've been offered another Christ and another truth, which is not another, it's a lie. And if you want to see the side-by-side -side comparison, let me just tell you in this video what you're going to discover is what Gail Ripplinger, Gail Ripplinger discovered. Her motivation was to compare the authentic word of Almighty God with every permutation of error that's now available and to try to find out what the motive is behind the production of all these counterfeit Bibles. But do you know what she discovered and what you will learn if you watch that, that video or if you read Gail's book? You'll find out that the agenda of all these new Bibles is as plain as the nose on your face. Their, their collective purpose <clears throat> is to reduce Jesus, the Messiah, the one who confirmed the covenant in his blood for one week, 2,000 years ago, the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, Christ the Lamb, the Messiah, was not the Messiah 
according to these new Bible versions, but he was just a, a good man, a good teacher, at best a prophet. Because they, make, they remove all reference to his blood. To his blood. They make no reference to his blood. They make no reference to his deity. Every time in the King James Version, Christ's deity is confirmed in plain language that even a fifth grader can read. They complicate the text to make it appear that Christ was not the Messiah and did not shed his blood. The consequences of that are unspeakable if one understands the very purpose for our Messiah, our Lamb, to come and shed his blood to wash away our sins. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's what the Bible says. You can't get any clearer than that. Even a fifth grader can read that and understand that God has a law. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So what does Satan do? just eliminates from all the Bibles any reference to Jesus' blood. Bring into question the very possibility that Jesus even died on the cross and maybe ran off with Mary Magdalene and had a, a baby and raised a family and they, their lineage still exists today. You know, there's a, an organization associated with the Roman Catholic Church called the Priory of Zion that say they have the Holy Grail the fa- that they are the protectors of the family, the genetic descendants of Jesus Christ. That's what they want you to believe. They want you to believe exactly what the Muslims believe. Jesus didn't die on the cross. Well, there was somebody that died on the cross, and he looked a lot like Jesus, but it wasn't Jesus. That's what the Quran teaches. The Jews don't believe that Jesus was their Messiah, and Rome wants the papacy to be the world's Messiah, so they're all working together. And the Bible perversions assist in that belief by, number one, destroying the truth, the King James Bible, and to get you to look at lies, all lies. and to believe a lie, and to teach lies. And that's why they teach lies in the churches. They've renounced the authentic, preserved King James Version of the Bible, and you can read from any perversion you choose in those churches because they've got an agenda to destroy the divinity of Christ, to destroy any efficacy in his blood, to even bring into the question whether Jesus really was the Messiah, to bring into question whether he really died on the cross and did anything for mankind. And that way, after all the world's minds have been changed and doubtful now about Jesus Christ, they're going to present to you a false Christ, an antichrist. But they've got to have a modern nation state of Israel to do it. They've got to have Jews living in the land. They've got to have a seven-year peace treaty to build a temple, begin animal sacrifices again. Three and a half years after the signing of that peace treaty, they need to have someone renege on the treaty and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And then to present to you a false Christ, to present to the world a false Christ. That is the purpose, and that is the accomplishment of every single one of these counterfeit Bibles. And it's only apparent to those who diligently know and seek God's Word, the authorized King James Version of the Bible, and then compare it with all of those lies, all of those Bibles, side by side, comparing Scripture with Scripture, making note of what it does to the meaning of God's Word, cataloging them and then analyzing them to discover the motive and the purpose for all those Bible perversions. And there is a motive and there is a purpose. It's diabolical. It's straight from the pit. And when you see this information, you don't have to take Tom Fress's word for it. 
If you'll just spend two hours and 30 minutes of your life by watching that video, or if you go to a Bible bookstore and buy this book and read it for yourself, you'll come to the undeniable conclusion. Unless you're intellectually twisted and you don't have an honest intellect to begin with, you're going to come to the same conclusion that I've come to. When you watch that video, it's going to make you want to vomit what they've done to God's work. Do you realize that they are so clumsy in their attempt to counterfeit God's authentic word that reading along in, in, in one of the books in the Bible, one of the chapters of the Bible, the verses go verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, and it gets down to verse 20, and then all of a sudden verse 21, 22, and 23 are completely missing. And it picks up the count at verse 24. That's right. They even leave the numbering there as a testimony is what they've done to the Bible. It goes from verse 20 to verse 24. And they'll show it to you. And then you can open up your King James Bible, go to that same book, that same chapter, those same verses, and find that verse 21 is there, verse 22 is there, and verse 23 is there. And then if you study verse 21, 22, and 23 and understand what they're talking about, you find out why they wanted to take those three verses out. It's as plain as the nose on your face. They're attacking the divinity of Christ, the deity of Christ, the law-giving status of Christ, and his blood. They are reducing Jesus from God manifest in the flesh to bring into question whether he ever existed at all, much less became anyone's savior. That's the New World Order religion. That's what they want you to believe. They want you to give up on Christ and look for another. They want you to give up on the kingdom of heaven and look for an earthly kingdom. They want you to give up your hope in a divine Christ and look for a human one. They want you to give up on the Savior that says he will destroy with the brightness of his coming and get you to accept a dark one. You pay attention to the nonsense that's coming out of the church today and what they focus on, you can agree with me they are quite successful in their agenda. Successful doesn't even describe it. They are so successful that anyone who holds to that authentic King James Bible and believes what it says without changing one jot or tittle and understands the meaning of those scriptures, they're going to be discovered. They're going to be described as radical fundamentalists, and we all know already what they plan to do with radical fundamentalists. Look what they did to the radical fundamentalists of Islam, who weren't going to go along with this new world order. As deceived as they are, believing in the Quran, a phony gospel, according to their God, they're not going to go along with the New World Order. They had to be eliminated. And the United States military did that elimination so that this New World Order agenda can go on. What do you think they intend to do with us who hold to the authentic word of God, the God of power, the God of prophecy, the God of creation, the God who bore our sins on his body and then revealed to us his counterfeit in the world, the papacy. What do you think they're going to do to us? Well, don't let that scare you. Because hundreds of millions just like us have died in history. Rome has waged war against the saints since the beginning of that church, and she continues today 
on a scale so vast and so broad that no one even recognizes it for what it is. But our God can restore to us life. Our God says the earth is mine and all that's in it. He has in his hand the key of life and death. And he, and only he, shed his blood for us. For without the, remi- without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now compare that with the papacy. He says, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof, doesn't he? Calls himself the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Has spent nearly 2,000 years trying to pervert God's word by, by locking it up in Latin making sure the common people could read it for themselves. Then when, the, when God wanted the Bible printed in the languages of the people, the papacy went about burning those Bibles and burning the people that read them. And when the Inquisition couldn't do the job on a grand enough scale, they simply resorted to world wars. It's all about the Bible. It's all about the King James Bible. It's got to be eliminated or people are not going to buy this future seven-year period of time. They're not going to buy this future temple. They're not going to buy this future Israel. They're not going to buy the future sacrifices. And they're not going to buy the future Antichrist Messiah. It's got to be eliminated. Just like they eliminated the radical fundamentalist Islamists, they're going, to radic- they're going to destroy the radical fundamentalist, God-believing, God-fearing, God-obeying, God-worshipping Bible believers, King James Bible believers. But what if we die? What have we lost if we gain Christ? I think the only sensible thing to do would be to voluntarily go through your house, round up all those Bible perversions, and burn them so no one else can be deceived by them. And get yourself an authentic Word of God, the King James Bible. You'll have to special order it. They don't carry them on the shelf. As a matter of fact, if you order one, they're probably going to look at you like you've got two heads. You want what? But get it anyway. And read it like your life depends on it, because it does. You know, there's only one truth. Truth is a singularity. You add to it or take away from it or change it in any way, it's no longer the truth. It's a lie. And if you tell lies long enough and many lies long enough, the truth is overwhelmed, isn't it? That's exactly what they've done with the Scriptures. Rome's battle against God and Rome's battle against God's Word is ongoing. It's escalating. It's more powerful than it's ever been in history. And we must stop the lies. We must know the truth. We must read God's word and know the truth and abandon all the lies. Because if you don't, you're going to be deceived. That's all there is to it. And now let me conclude by giving you the single most important aspect of this discussion. The Bible tells us in plain language that even a fifth grader can understand that the Bible is of no private interpretation. You can't just read God's Word and put whatever meaning upon it that you think you have to, cons- you have to compare Scripture with Scripture because the Scripture interprets itself. If you want a definition for a word, just keep reading, probably in the same verse, the the Bible will give you the definition of that word. 
God uses uh, parallel speech in his Bible. I wish I could think, I wish I had prepared an example for you. But he'll say something in the first phrase of, of a verse, and he repeats the same thing in the second phrase of the verse, just simply using other language, more understandable. And there's your definition. And anywhere else you see that word in the Bible, you have already the definition. The Bible interprets itself. Now, what happens if somebody changes the text of that Bible? It can no longer interpret itself. You can't find the definition for words. You can't find the fulfillment of prophecies. The continuity is lost. And so now all of a sudden, when you're reading the Scriptures, since the Bible no longer defines itself, the Bible no longer uh, 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 proves itself, the Bible no longer interprets itself, you must rely on an outside source for that information. And guess what? Satan has prepared for you already on a silver platter that outside source. Isn't it wonderful? He thinks of everything, doesn't he? You know, the papacy used to say, you must believe what the Pope says. Only he is endued with the Holy Spirit. Only he can read and interpret the Scripture, and you must eat from his hand. You must eat the manna from his hand and his hand only. And no matter what the Bible says, you have to believe the Pope's interpretation, the Pope's definition. And just to make sure you didn't go off on yourself and start reading the scriptures to make sure that it was unavailable to you. Or at worst, that you were never educated and could never learn to read any language, let alone Latin. And so for all the dark ages, man, destitute, starving for the truth, starving to know God, were spoon-fed by the priest, lies. False interpretations, false definitions. You just simply had to take the priest's word for it. And that was your faith. Whatever Rome dispensed, that's what you got. And if you got the truth, it had to be by divine means. And that's the way they want it to be today. So they make the Bible so it cannot interpret itself. You have to rely on an outside source. And guess who that is? The papacy. The theologians of the Roman Catholic Church. You know what they want you to believe? That Jesus wasn't the Messiah. There's a future Messiah coming. A fleshly one. An earthly one. It goes far, far deeper than this. There's not time, nor do I have voice enough to describe it all. But I think I've given you enough. God said the Bible is of no private interpretation. It interprets itself until you change it. Then it can't interpret anything. So you must rely on an outside source. And Satan has already provided that outside source. You can call it the New King James, the New American Standard Bible, the NAB, the REB, the RSV, the CEV, the TEV, the GNB, the Living, the Phillips, the New Jerusalem, the Century Bible. You can call it chicken soup, but it's not God's word. And the consequences are incalculable, both spiritually and temporally incalculable. And the fury from Almighty God's throne will be indescribable when it happens. Get the book. New Age Bible Versions by Gail Ripplinger. Go to YouTube. Just Google her name, Gail Ripplinger. Go to YouTube, put in the search engine, 
Gail Ripplinger and watch her two-hour and 33-minute video, and you'll agree with me, this is the most important subject that man can discuss in this time today. With that, I'll leave you all with the blessing from the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Don't look for another. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, Jorg, do you have any comments? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tom, for that wonderful explanation. And if somebody really thinks that the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy for that is, uh, sustains the reading of the Bible, I have a quote for you that is taken from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 12, page 496. Quote, The supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. It is unhistorical. End quote. So, when you analyze this sentence that I just read to you, and you put it in context to everything that Tom just said, you will see where the deception comes from in the first place. It's the Roman Catholic Church that has suppressed the Bible, the Holy Word of God, all through the centuries, starting right after the New Testament was written, which is about 95 AD, when, when that was completed. And the Gospel went to the first churches, Smyrna, or Philadelphia, I don't have all the names, but the seven churches are very, no, very well known to you, I guess. So, And ever from there on, they tried to change that word. And um, next to the video that, um, and the book that Tom mentioned, um, there is a video that I saw some time ago, and um, that made me aware of all the corrupted Bibles that are there. And that is a lecture from Walter Feit. That lecture is already a few years old. I don't know how old exactly. But I can tell you that when you watch some of the newer lectures of Walter Feit, he cites from the new King James Bible, the NKGB, which, like Tom said, is corrupted and changed in about 6,000 different places. And even though that he made this lecture called Battle of the Bibles in this total onslaught series that you can easily find when you type in Battle of the Bibles, whether in Google or in YouTube, and this will pop right up, coming from Amazing Discoveries, the umbrella organization that Walter Feit is working off, which is, by the way, if you don't know that, a 501c3 organization, and when you go to that main site of that organization, there's even a video where Walter White is giving his uh, life testimony, how he came to all this and, and, and what did he do in his life on all the teaching. Uh, there he states that he has been studying uh, at the University of Cape Town. And when you look that up, you will see that the University of Cape Town is a Jesuit university. So, some years ago, he made this video, which is an hour and uh, 27 minutes long, called Battle of the Bibles from Total Onslaught. And there he compares all the different scriptures that laid the foundation of the different Bibles to be written. Um, he takes, for example, the Douai Bible, which is as we know, the Jesuit Bible, and he takes the KGV Bible. And um, there are even two more videos on the same subject called Changing the Word, also from Walter Fight. But what amazes me and what I do not understand is when you listen to the newer broadcast that Walter Fight does, that he reads from the new King James Version, which is absolutely himself contradicting him of anything that he has done before in all his other lectures. So I certainly will, for myself, look up the video and the book that Tom 
so very fine advised us to read about the New Age versions of the Bible. And I think that also the other video that I just mentioned, Battle of the Bibles and Changing the World from Walter Fight, are very interesting to see here. And when you remember the quote that I just read from the Catholic Encyclopedia, uh, how they damn the Bible, and when you go a little bit into history and you see the persecutions that people like the Lollards and the Valdenses had to go through, sometimes even centuries, like the Valdenses who lived in, um, in the mountains of Switzerland, where there is another very interesting three-part video uh, series on, on YouTube that you can find. It's called Israel of the Alps. And there you can see how these people who went out from the mountains of Switzerland into Italy, into Austria, into Germany, into all the other countries that were surrounding them, they sent monks, they sent their teachers out there to teach the real word of God to the people. And they were everywhere where they came, they were persecuted, they were tortured, and they were killed. And when you look at the Valdenses today, the Valdenses still exist, but the Valdenses have been corrupted in the meantime also. There is no remnant from these old Bible societies anymore over. They have all been whether completely wiped out or they have been corrupted. I just wanted to add that to Tom's statement. But mine is not that long, but I hope even interesting <laughs> as this was. Michael, back to you. Yeah, it looks like uh, Tom wants to give us uh, closing comments. And uh, <clears throat> But I'd like to give a couple examples, unless you want to do the closing comments first. Do you want to do the closing comments first, Tom? Or can I give you a couple examples of changes? Are you there, Tom? Is anybody there? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, all right. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. I'll try to get this. It's not working. Anyways, um, an example of a change. Now, if we go to First Colossians one fourteen, in the King James Bible, it's talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if you look at one fourteen, it says, "In whom, in whom we have redemption." Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now let's look what the other Bibles say. We'll start with the NIV. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. No blood, is there, Michael? No blood. So you brought this up before the show, and we're going to, end, uh, uh, we're going to bring it up again here because it's an important uh, element, obviously. <laughs> And God has a law. God has a law. God has an unchanging law. God never changes his law. And God has a law that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Right. So we'll look at the New Living Translation. It says, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins? Uh, English Standard Version says, in whom... We have redemption and forgiveness for sin, so it's the same as the NIV. Uh, the New King, King James Version is the same. The international as the King James Bible, it does mention the blood. Um, let's see, the International Standard Version says, through whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Um, let's see if we can find a few more. Um, even even the Jesuit Bible says the the correct thing is in whom we have redemption through His blood, remission of sins, which is ironic. Once again, the well, Jesuit look, Rome Rome calls her sacrifice of the Mass a bloodless sacrifice, 
and yet they turn around and say that the wine, which only the priest drinks in the Catholic Church, it's not given to the people, they say the wine is his blood. So right. they deny that they deny in in the Roman Catholic Mass, whether it's the new Mass or the old Mass, the cup is denied the people. Now, whether they call it a bloodless sacrifice or whether or they call it a blood that the priest drinks the blood, the people don't get the blood. Okay, <laughs> so so see see how they double speak, but they deny the people the blood. That's that's what it's all about. Right. To, to change the, the power of the blood. The blood is for the priest. That makes, you know, it's, a, it's an attempt to, to put the priest into a deified status. And the people get their salvation from the priest. It's diabolical what they do. Yes. And, um, yeah, going back to this, uh, as far as other translations or other Bibles, uh, yeah, the new the English Revised Version, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins, no mention of the blood. Uh, Darby's Bible re- takes out the mention of the blood. Uh, the World English tra- Bible translation takes out the the blood, and on and on it goes. So now. This is one example. Then, you know, how about uh, we do another example? Um, let's see. How about uh, Luke four eight? Now, with Luke four eight, it's talking about in the end. There's, or in there, it's talking about the phrase "Get the behind me, Satan." I wonder why has so many of them have taken that away. Sorry for the pause here, folks, but I gotta have to look this up. I'm looking up through um, BibleHub.com, and I strongly recommend anybody using it because um, it is a very powerful tool. You go verse by verse in the Bible and compare all these different Bibles, and, and you, real fast you'll see the changes. Um, and you don't have to be, you know, a Bible scholar to do this because it's right there for you. They've done all the work for you. So I'm going to look for um, this four and verse eight. You can find it now. Let's get apologies for the, the pause here. Okay. In the King James Bible, verse four, uh, excuse me, chapter four, verse eight of Luke, it says, "And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve." Um, let's see what the international, the New International Version says. And Jesus answered, "It is written." Worship the Lord, Lord your God and serve him only. So it takes out, completely it takes out, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is, or at least get thee behind me, Satan. So well, I mean, the question you should ask is why do they feel necessary to take out, get thee behind me, Satan? The New Living Translation says, uh, Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So here we see in the, the newer versions, they're taking out the identity of our enemy. See, I feel that it's a pretty important uh, issue to be raised because, you know, why are they taking out Satan? Um, the English Standard Version, Jesus answered him, It is written, for you should worship the Lord your God, and him only should you serve. Um, once again, they, they've, they've taken out Satan. I feel it's a pretty important issue. I don't know what you think, gentlemen. Do you think that's an important issue that they took out Satan in this verse? Very telling, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, they want us not to know who our Savior is, and they don't want us to know who our enemy is. 
And I want to do one more. Sorry about the pause and all that, because I have to do the little research thing that I have to do here uh, as far as on the, the website. But um, another important issue, I believe, that would be was that Luc- uh, about Lucifer, Isaiah 14.12. Let me look that up. If anybody, any of you want to talk while I'm looking it up, that'd be great. But if not, uh, we'll just have a little pause. Um, Isaiah. Then I got to find 14. And then I got to find 12. And this is a very powerful tool. I strongly, once again, recommend folks. Use BibleHub.com. It's it's really easy to, to access, and uh, you can go straight to verse for verse. You have a parallel uh, demonstration of uh, all the different Bibles and what they say verse by verse, and uh, it takes all the mystery away. Uh, you know, the scholarship that you need to have prior to having this tool. So it says. And King James Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Okay. Now, if you look at the other ones, let's see, like the, the, the uh, New International Version, NIV, How have you fallen from heaven, morning star? Son of the dawn? No, no Lucifer. No, in fact, you know, isn't it the issue here, too, is who is the morning star? Yeah. Who is the morning star? Confusion, isn't it? Yeah. Because, it's, you know, the morning, the morning star is the title reserved for Lord Jesus. Yes. And the title for Satan is Son of the Morning. And... Uh, yeah, let's see. If that, is that is that actually the case? That is in King James. Oh yeah. Well, well Son well, of the Morning and Star of the Morning. That's uh, just uh, two different th- two different things, you know. Right. This, uh, when you read right. then the oh, yeah, 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 yeah. version, sorry. Uh, when you read then the International Standard Version, it says, "How have you fallen from heaven, Day Star, Son of the Dawn, Day Star?" <laughs> that, that's that's again. That's Jesus. Oh, and, you know, so yeah, here we go, uh, like the English standard trans- translation going over what you're saying. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? Who are you to cut down the ground? Who, who, are, who you are cut down to the ground? You who laid the nations low. I mean, if you even read that sentence, I mean, you would have to be a I mean, it doesn't even make any sense to me, to be honest with you. How are you, know what the, you know what the truth <laughs> is? People all over the world would be offended if somebody changed the language in the book entitled Moby Dick. <laughs> I mean, people would be stampeding the streets. Somebody changed Moby Dick. They don't care that Satan changes God's word. You know, I'm going to make this memorable to people. Right after the flood, after God had destroyed the world for the, ma- the imaginations of men's hearts were only evil continually. God destroyed the world and he saved Mo- uh, Noah and his family, and only they survived. And not long after the flood, there rose a man by the name of Nimrod who defied God's word, kept all the people together. You know, God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That means move off fill the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Nimrod said, no, God's wrong. We're going to keep all the people here in the plains, and we're going to to build us a tower that will reach even unto heaven. And the people were all of one speech and of one mind. Nimrod was their king, and and Nimrod led the people to rebel against God. And what did God do? He said, see, the people are one. They have one speech. Let us go down and confound their languages. Now, when he confounded their languages, those of like speech moved off, didn't they, to make the nations. 
to, to, to go forth and fill the earth and not stay in the plains and worship a man and obey a man and to do that thing that they attempted to do, to build their own kingdom, their own heavenly kingdom. God confounded their languages. You know, that just ticks Satan off to no end. That God confounded the languages, divided the people, and Nimrod no longer had a job, did he? He couldn't get the people together. They couldn't talk. They couldn't communicate. They couldn't rebel against God with understanding. They couldn't continue their endeavor of rebellion. God confounded their language and thereby created the nations. You know what's happening today? Satan is just confounding God's language. What we're seeing with these Bible perversions is Satan's answer to what God did to destroy his earthly kingdom back right after the flood. And he's raised up a modern-day Nimrod to do it. It's called the papacy. It's just Satan's answer. Satan's return to what God did at the Tower of Babel by confounding the languages and confounding Satan's global government. And now Satan is just confounding God's language with all these Bible perversions. You know it. You know it's the truth. You know it's the truth. Deep down in your soul... You know what I just told you is the absolute truth. No one can add to it. No one can take away from it. It's the demonstrative truth in the Bible and in history. So what are you doing when you're reading one of these perverted Bibles? You're confounding God's speech. You've made an attack against the throne of Almighty God. You have served Lucifer... You have served Nimrod, both the Babylonian Nimrod and the Roman Nimrod, by reading one of those perverted Bibles, confounding God's speech. And it ought to be plainly evident to even the most simple minds what a crime it is to read and preach out of one of those Bibles. And if you're going to a church that's using one of these Bible perversions, you must protest. And if they will not conform to God's Word, the King James Bible, then get yourself up and move out and start a home church somewhere and revere God's Word and condemn the counterfeit. I think this needs to be exposed all over the world. What the real purpose of this is, Satan is just answering what God did at the Tower of Babel by confounding God's language. And I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything else that could be more impressive upon a man's mind, an honest man's mind, a man who wants to know the truth, who's seeking the truth and wants to know his God that Satan is just counterfeiting what God did at the Tower of Babel by producing so many variations, so many perversions of God's speech. Over to you, Jerk. You had something to say. Yeah. Um, when we go back to um, Isaiah fourteen twelve, and we read carefully the King James Bible, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to, down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. You will see that Lucifer actually here is being condemned. And when you want to read how Lucifer is in the same way glorified, then you have to look at what the Net Bible writes. Quote, Look how you have fallen from the sky, O shining one, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, O conqueror of the nations. <laughs> when you compare these two, you will see that in the King James Bible, Satan is condemned, and in the Net Bible, he's been hailed. Confusion. Not only confusion, but even when you take it a little further, you could say that the Net Bible 
makes Satan God. Isn't that Satan's ultimate objective? Indeed. God destroyed the language of the people by confounding their language, stopped the line of communication so that the people could not all together serve Nimrod. Now, Satan has confounded the language of of the Bible so people cannot unite and worship Christ. It's as plain as the nose on your face what the strategy of all this is. Yeah, it makes it very clear that um, the thing that we once talked about, I don't know if you remember that, Tom, um, we were speaking about Bill Cooper. When he was starting his Mystery Babylon series, that in the beginning he gave an explanation that always not only struck me, but always uh, kept in, uh, I always kept in my mind. When he said that the Freemasons, um, the Illuminati, and all these so-called illumined ones turn the Bible in that way around that they say Adam and Eve have been captive by God in the Garden of Eden, dumped down, and Lucifer, bringing them the light, bringing them the knowledge, turned it all around and freed Adam and Eve from a cruel and vindictive God. And when you read this next Bible text, it all falls together. It absolutely makes sense. Yeah. They teach that Satan is the good one and the God of the Bible is the bad one. Now, take a minute. Beginning last year, 2014, a movie came into the cinemas called Noah. And that was, even according to the director, the most unbiblical movie made about the Bible ever made. That were his own words. They twist the truth 180 degrees. Good is bad, bad is good. Black is white, and white is black. Where have we heard that before? Yeah. Like in the oath of inductment of the, the fourth oath of the Jesuits, when the judge hierarchy tells me black is white and white is black, I will see it that way because the hierarchy tells me so. Yeah. This is how they corrupt the Bibles. This is how they corrupt the belief system. And this is how they, through Hollywood, where you have actually go into, comes from holy wood, meaning a wand that a sorcerer uses to make his wonders and performances, putting spells on people, that's actually what Hollywood does. It puts spells on people and it turns the truth 180 degrees around so that right is wrong, wrong is right, war is peace, peace is war, black is white, white is black, truth is lie and lie is truth. And good is evil and evil is good. Yeah. Okay, I knew I forgot something in that, in that summary. <laughs> but you get the gist. And they use these Hollywood actors, and they use, of course, this dumbed-down people who run to the cinema, oh, a movie about a flood. That never happened anyway. Uh, we're going to see that. And they twist the word of God 180 degrees around so that nobody is, going to will, uh, is willing to go look at the word of God anymore. That is how you take people away from the Bible anyway, even the corrupted Bibles. And that gives the church the authority that it had all through the Dark Ages, that only the church, only the priest from his pulpit, only the, 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 yeah, the priest from his pulpit could preach what was in the Bible. And it was his, his explanation of the Bible that you had to take for granted because you couldn't check on it because you weren't allowed to have a Bible. And if you had a Bible, it was written in Latin, a dead language that nobody of the lay people ever understood, which was one of the reasons why the Reformation had such, such success when they implemented the Bible in the Vulgar tongue 
means in the lung uh, in the tongue of the people what they were speaking and they could read the word of God for themselves. But then of course you have to make sure that you get the real word of God, that you don't fall into the text of Alexandria which is the basis of all the Catholic Bibles. And Alexandria, where is that? Egypt. Egypt. Sun worship. Where it comes from. And there is the big distinction, and that's something that you would see, I don't know, in the video that you talked about, but surely in the video of uh, Walter Feit, Battle of the Bibles, that the basis for the King James Bible are the original Hebrew writings and Greek writings out of Antioch, and Tyndale used also 70% of that, at least, for his, uh, for his Bible. And the same was used for the Geneva Bible, the Geneva 1599. I have not, never compared these two Bibles, and when you go to Bible Hub, you will also not find the Geneva Bible in there. Why would that be? Because I think next to the King James Bible, the Geneva Bible of 1599 comes closest to the Word of God, like... Um, the Bible, uh, the King James Bible from 1611. That's right. And what's so, what, what they hate the most about the Geneva Bible is that it, separate from the text, it contained uh, the teachings of the Protestants in instruction. And it taught that the papacy was the fulfillment of Daniel, John, and Paul's prophecy about the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn. And, uh, Satan has been trying to cover up that reality. That's why they replaced the, the Geneva Bible. The King James Bible didn't have any of those commentaries in it. And, uh, and I'm not advocating commentary. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let the Bible interpret itself. But clearly, the, 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 the authors of the Geneva Bible uh, used God's word, unadulterated, and simply instructed the people with separate commentary. And they were dead right in their description of the papacy as the fulfillment of the Antichrist of the Bible. And that's what, that's what, uh, that's what Rome hates the most, is those who can read the Scriptures and come to the right conclusion about the Antichrist, about the papacy. And uh, that, that's why the King James Version doesn't have any commentary in it. But it's still the unadulterated Word of God. It's the, the only English translation that we can rely upon. And the rest are just attempts to destroy and to change God's language and make the Bible so that it cannot interpret itself, so that we must rely upon a preacher or a priest. And they're all the same. The authority, the unquestionable authority, they're making themselves infallible, that you must believe what they teach about the Scriptures, that you must not read the Scriptures for yourself. And if you do read the Scriptures for yourself, you have to read one of their perversions that cannot interpret itself, that you must rely upon the hierarchy to tell you the meaning. We're just... We're just simply seeing the Dark Ages restored. We're simply seeing Babel restored, only flipped on its head. Now God's language is being confounded so that we cannot all unite to worship and to obey him. And uh, the examples, you know, we, we've tried in an impromptu and an informal way of giving examples of how these perversions, these Bible perversions, adulterate God's speech. And But if you want to see it presented in such a way that flows and, and makes sense and you can see it for yourself, that video by Gail Ripplinger is indispensable. And it's stunning. It, it will keep you spellbound. If you love God's Word and you want to see how Satan has destroyed it, that video is just worth its weight in gold. And uh, it, it, there's no better instruction available that I'm aware of. There's much out there. 
in defense of the King James Bible. But there's no better, I don't think there's any better uh, source to demonstrate the motive and the objective behind all these counterfeit Bibles than Gail Ripplinger's video or her book, New Age Bible Versions. Gail Ripplinger, Common Spelling. And with that, I think I'm going to dismiss myself. Thanks for having me, and looking forward to the next time. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I just wanna, I just wanna um, blend out with an uh, with another quote that you should think about. It takes nothing to join the crowd, but it takes everything to stand alone. Well said. All right. Well, I'm going to, uh, before we close here, I guess I'm going to give one more example of another changing of verses here. Uh, <clears throat> try to be polite about it, but uh, we'll go at nine, Mark 3, verse 29. And this is about the uh, blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. So it says, and this is Christ speaking, and he says, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now let's look what the other Bibles say. <clears throat> the NIV. But whosoever blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, or excuse me, the Holy Spirit, will never be forgiven, and they are guilty of an eternal sin. Now think about that. The King James is saying that, you know, we're in danger of eternal damnation for blaspheming the Holy Ghost. But the NIV is saying that we are guilty of an eternal sin. Uh, the, uh, and the New Living Translation says, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This is a sin of eternal consequences. Um, and then another, all the rest of them there are saying you know, eternal sin, eternal sin, eternal sin, instead of eternal damnation, uh, minimizing the consequence of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So you'll see over and over again with all these different translations, the minimizing of the blood of Christ and the necessity of Christ's blood and the shedding of his blood for our sins, um, removing Satan the name of our adversary, uh, confusing the name of Satan in Christ, and minimizing the consequences of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. So, <clears throat> I think we've proven our point here. So, gentlemen, thank you for your time. And, um, okay, uh, everyone have to take care. Uh, by the way, for all those who uh, wished me a happy birthday today, thank you. I've been getting a lot of folks giving me uh, wishes at birthday on Facebook and uh, and that so uh, thank you for thinking about me so with that everyone God bless and have a good day thank you gentlemen.